Animal, your lamentations in the sand. Mother, her red bones come knocking. Mother, her red bones come knocking at the floorboards. My mother knock knocking at his skull when he dreams. Scratching at your door, my dry rattle of Morse code. Father, let me in with the mash mouth spirits who enter us. Father, the split fibula where the marrow must rust. Father, the soft drum in my ear. Daughter, unweeding her familiar mischief. Mother jangling the rib cage. I am here. Uh, you know, I wrote that poem hoping that one day my father would read it and he would hear me, would hear what I have to say. I must say that's the first time I actually, you know, it caught me. But poetry can do that. Um, this is my next poem. The title comes from um, a line of Rambo, a translated line of Rambo. In childhood, certain skies refined my seeing. Sunset. That blood orange hymn combusting the year, Nautilus chamber of youth's obscurities, your empty room for psalms, lost rituals. There find the bitter sweetness of one's unknown body, heliotropic. Welcome, stranger of myself. Consider the jumbie bird clanging its death shriek like a gong, shooting through our mapless season, unnaming the home you're always leaving, scattering the names we have lost again. The heart and its bombshell bespeak the hurricane. What has drowned has drowned. She will not return. The headless sky unseals and aches for us, mother and sister caught upon the steel hook of its memory. Wet mouth of my future body, we've come to understand each word and how sometimes the words themselves will do. Obiaman, Augud Island, I am called to remember the burning palm and the broad refuge of the poinciana tree. Dear family, how willingly I pushed my feet into the hot coals of your lamentation. Jamaica, if I wear your lunacy like a hard skin or lock this day away in the voodoo garden of our parting, know that I still mimic your wails knee deep in beach. No, I am gouging the stars for any trace of ghost. For the algorithm of uncertain history, the simple language of our cannibal sea, if, grandfather, your wandering fishermen still recast their lives down on the disappearing shore, no, I too am scorching there, igniting and devouring each abducted day. This next poem is called Mermaid. Caribbean time is 10 times stronger than the English variety. Just ask Miss Queenie and her Royal Navy who couldn't yank a Jamaican weed from her rose garden that didn't grow back thick, tenfold, and blackened with the furor of a violated man. The tepid American I sank with my old shoes over the jaws of the Atlantic could never understand the hard clamor of my laugh, why I furrowed rough at the brow, why I knew the hollow points of every bone. But dig where the soil is wet and plant the proud seed of your shame tree. Don't let them say it never grew. Roll the saltfish barrel down the hill, sending that battered thunder clanging at the seaside moon, jangled by her long earrings at our sea, ten times bluer than the bluest eye. That mint tea whistling in the Dutch pot is stronger than liquor and takes six spoons of sugar, please. What can I say? 
My great-grandfather's blood was clotted thick with sugar cane and overproof rum. And when he bled, it trickled heavy like molasses, clotted black like phlegm in the throat. Every red ant from the grill to Frenchman's Cove came to burrow and suckle at his vein, where his leg was honeyed with a diabetic rot. And when he caught my grandmother in his wide fishing net, he served her up cold to his wide-eyed son, mermaid on the deck. Um, I'll read this poem that Matthew briefly mentioned in his intro and we talked about uh, yesterday when I visited his class. It's called, it's called, uh, it's the shortest poem I've ever written and it's called Autobiography. When I was a child, I counted the looper moths caught in the dusty mesh of our window screens fed them slowly into the hot mouth of a kerosene lamp, then watched them pop and blacken soundlessly, but could not look away. I had known what it was to be nothing, bore the shamed blood letter of my sex like a banishment, wore the bruise mark of my father's hands to school in silence. And here I am, still at the old window, dying of thirst, watching my girl self asleep with the candle flame alive in my ear, little sister yelling, fire. Um, so I, um, I did my MFA at the University of Virginia. I spent three years living in Charlottesville, and while I was there, I wrote most of this book, and I wrote a lot of the poems in the second section of Cannibal. And um, part of the book is a series um, called Notes on the State of Virginia, in which I'm kind of interrogating Thomas Jefferson's own text with, of the same name. And so I'll read the first of that series, Notes on the State of Virginia 1. I actually think this is my first reading I've done in Virginia since I graduated from <laughs> Charlottesville. So I'm back in Virginia, here we go, Notes on the state of Virginia, one. Child of the colonies, carrying the swift waves of oceans inside of you, the wide dark of centuries, the whole world plunged down, sewn through the needle's eye, the old crows glisten in your gullet, eyes beetling through black. You wear your mother's face in the mirror, your mouth closed around all those pills like teeth, each one so heavy your tongue falls numb. Think of your friend who only wanted you to find sleep, whose face asked you not to choose the worst. Dull wretch, slack jaw orphan, you always feel sorry for yourself and swallow each capsule like the last pearl your grandfather pressed into your palm, how he had dived three whole days for it, your grandfather who loved you but could not say it, all the men who love you and cannot say it. Jamaica, old fur sticking to the roof of my mouth, the one long dream that holds me underwater, black centipede I still teeth on. Here I could come up for air. Here I could wake with a name I can answer to, where Thomas Jefferson learned how to belittle a thing, how to own it. 
He created the word and wanted my mouth to know it. He wanted the whole world pull through me on a fishing string, where I will find my fingers in the muscle of my throat, where I will marvel at the body asking to live. Um, I'll read this one that I wrote. Um, I spent a Christmas in Virginia um, while I was there studying and I lived, it was a really peculiar place to live for many reasons. Um, but this particular poem, I remember that winter I had um, a neighbor at the end of my street who flew a Confederate flag and um, he also flew a Gadsden flag, which I, I learned. Um, is it the flag with the snake on it that says, don't tread on me? Let's call it Gadsden flag. Um, I'm always learning their new ways and names and terms for hate in America. Um, and yeah, that's all I'll say. I wrote this poem while living on that street. Another white Christmas in Virginia. The house at the end of my street has been looming all winter. Perched garishly through this sour season, pepper lights slinking red gold in its wake, heralding the sign of its own coronation, its million chittering fires, Chevy pickup colony declaring the sidewalk. This, their own white sky, old names they refuse to bury. The whole yard, a boisterous spectacle. I long to set fire to all of it. The glimmering reindeer, fat snowman inflating his visible lung, ghost child ringing his one horse bell through the night, that bright harassment of Santa's, the idea of America burning holes in the lawn. Who could live here with enough mirth to power my city, enough of myself haunting me in some other place? Nonetheless, one matchstick man comes and goes on their horizon, walking hard on his invisible horse, Confederate buckle stroke kicking toothpick silences. No words ever pass between us as he hoists and pulleys his large flag, daily hanging and freezing through the verbless rubble of these months, determined as an eagle clawing at its steady rituals. Don't tread on me. Still, I resolved to come friendly, built and nested my cowboy greeting, torched it out into his world and watched it choke soundless, die with my good foot caught in their blue hydrangeas. The hawk wife watching spies me smiling, waving in their driveway of angels, but swoops up her children and says nothing and retreats from some darkening on the horizon, some fast approaching plague. Um, I'll read. This next poem was another one that um, Matthew mentioned in his intro. A lot of these Virginia poems I haven't read in quite a while. I think now, you know, I feel like now is the time. Um, <laughs> this one is called 100 Amazing Facts About the Negro with Complete Proof One. And the title of this poem and the other poems in the series comes from a book by J.A. Rogers of the same name. And um, in the series, I'm kind of taking that title and leaning into a kind of irony, a kind of satirical voice. Um, 
uh, wearing my double gaze, as it were, and writing about what it means to be black in America, not only living that experience, but having daily to think about that experience through the eyes of another. The eyes of another that often sees you as less than. So this is 100 Amazing Facts About the Negro with Complete Proof, one. And this has an epigraph that I took from the book uh, of the same name. In 1670, Virginia passed a law forbidding Negroes from buying white people. This is true. This was 51 years after the Negro had arrived in chains. Free Negroes bought white people in such numbers in Louisiana that the state made a similar law in 1818. Beware the African in his natural state. His thoughts, much wilder and darker than you can imagine, bisect in blood knots in the trigger of his ribcage. In the ripe season, his blood will burn hot, each knot coils tight, a fist inside his body, with rigid animal violence, dark braids of hair. Hope, an ache called taut in his throat, will strain to form a black bark of words. Do not attempt to understand the diction of a Negro. He wakes in strange tongues and speaks entirely with his body. The Negro scrawls the language of the birds, dreams of bold rivers and molten crowns, your blue field peopled with bucksaw and burr heads, your hedges raised with piccaninny, starved black-eyed Susans, dark heads teeming remembering. Observe the teeth astonishingly white as they struggle to gesture beyond anger. The Negro will shatter before he is kind. Their women too, like dark acanthus, bear an unusual stench, are known to perish without direct sunlight and menstruate together. Too loud and easily provoked, they hoard in congregations and spit from vast distances. All Negroes prefer to be near the water. If they sense rain, they will swarm, strip naked, hum, dive, demand to be reborn, march barefoot through your garden to devour your weeds, to spook and mark new airs with venom. This is another notes on the state of Virginia too. Um, and this is, you know, a little bit about the history of Charlottesville as I found it there. Um, particularly while I was there as a student at UVA, um, they discovered in a lot of the dorm rooms that are on the lawn of uh, the campus that there were these rooms that had been bricked off in the 1970s and the rooms um, we've, we were told were actually rooms in which enslaved people used to live. The, you know, the students who came to campus brought with them their slaves and they lived in these rooms that were like underneath. Um, and somebody at Charlottesville thought it was better to brick them off than to face the history. And then the, these hidden rooms were rediscovered while I was there in 2012. Notes on the state of Virginia, too. February, I am an open wound. Woman discarded and woman emerging. Scars devising scars. To live here, we know precisely how to be haunted. Sundown sun, a sterile sky come running. Sweet gallow grass whistling ghosts. 
All year we learn that chainsaw hymnal, outside the lawn, another excavation. Slave quarters found concealed in the student dorms, buried rooms, choked sounds bricked off. Two centuries thorns may break sudden bloom. What can we say? No one speaks of it. I dream pristine. And skirting the caution tape, instead we clasp hands with each other in complicity. Somewhere the ghost arm of history is still throttling me. The taste of old blood on the wind. The crouched statue of Sacagawea shrouded behind the pioneers. Creature of unbelonging, unname a new silence. Magnolia, explosion, its leviathan shade. Then fall, what sick messiah, fall. I am coughing in the aisles again, where bare triage of voices pour molasses in my ear, where a bald insurrection of tongues. Then squashed rebellion, scrutiny, indoctrination. To live here, we know precisely how to be hunted. Okay, um, this will be my last of the, the Virginia poems. <laughs> um, and this is one that we also talked about briefly in class yesterday, and one that I haven't read in quite some time. Um, but I wrote it, the, 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 writ, the origin of the poem, or the seed from which the poem bloomed, was the first time I saw this strange American ritual of um, 12 men in long coats bringing out a groundhog named Punxsutawney Phil and <laughs> asking the groundhog to predict the weather. <laughs> I was like, huh, okay. Um, but this particular time that I, I watched, I saw this strange thing happening. The groundhog predicted that there would be six more weeks of winter. And all the people that had gathered to watch started to boo the groundhog. <laughs> and I thought it was like double, you know, not only quite hilarious and strange, but also something very savage about it. <laughs> And so, um, the, the poem begun there, and you know, around the same time, um, Mike Brown had just been killed in Ferguson, and I was thinking about the danger of being, you know, a black person in America, a black man in America, who gets to be a citizen, who gets to um, be paraded around a, a false sense of a justice system that you has no rules or order. It might very well just be 12 white men in coats asking you to predict the weather. And so this is America the Beautiful, and it has an epigraph from Allen's Gin Allen Ginsberg, his poem, from his poem, America. And this is the Ginsberg quote. America, this is quite serious. America, this is the impression I get from looking in the television set. America, is this correct? Silent and small, his white-tipped quills chilled this winter, a black groundhog emerges from the margins. He wants nothing of the 12 white men unfurling in their dark cloaks, each asking him a question for which they've long chosen an answer. A whole nation waits in front of them. 
Like his fathers before him, he is a footnote on the year, like a hanging nail, no different than my wild branch of blackamoors, cousins, and uncles, my brother, dark and beautiful, marking X's in his almanac. But the morning crowd who must be drunk this February are swaddled in a year's worth of our island clothes, Midwest heavy with hope, or whatever drags them out of bed to brandish signs, spit and call, their worn breaths misting each word's urgency, their heart's compass frozen, directionless. Who knows the dull rush of seasons here, the secrets of the finches. Ask the women in the picture box who now squeeze through the thin mirror of Hollywood to swoon in technicolor, lips that crime scene red. Even the birds make gowns for them. Slurping at their cocktails for the last scraps of pomegranate, the wet privilege of their summers, their perfect skin, only a Disney effect. Camouflaged in witch grass, small feather work of children. Oh, to be hungry and to be in. My foot slips like a baby's in this glass slipper of desire, while Phil dreams of hurricanes all winter, his dark mind obscuring. The humans boo for a whole minute, hurl obscenities at he who, quivering and illiterate, has done nothing but survive in his pine box and tried to understand his name. But every night in America, my brother is a criminal, gunned down for his clothes when he is not being shunned for the shadow of his face. Even the weatherman is in a rage, his blonde fringe frosting in the falling snow. He tells us of deer dying off in Montana after their hooves have made a perfect spiral in the grass. Tufts of cotton caged in the thorn of each antler, stiff with the blood of too many of us. We have no words for how we dream to die young, dream to wake up one morning and learn there will be an early spring. But how many ways can we reinvent violence? I hold this winter in my mouth like a pearl. Um, I will flip forward a little bit, let's see. Um, so I got my PhD at USC. I graduated two years ago, three years ago. Um, <laughs> but while I was there, I, um, I don't know, I, I, I encountered at that point, I had done so much school that when I got to my PhD, I was quite disappointed when I got the curriculum of all my classes and I encountered that it was still the same curriculum that I was being, that I'd been taught, you know, years ago when I was in undergrad. And, and by that, I mean it was a very static curriculum. It hadn't been decolonized. It was the same old, dead white men. And um, occasionally there would be like a token black author thrown in, um, and usually that author was W.B. Du Bois, no matter what the class was. For example, I took a class on Victorian literature, and would you guess it? <laughs> the one black author on the curriculum was W.E.B. Du Bois for Victorian literature. And I just decided, okay, it, that's enough. I, any, any class I'm taking, I'm gonna try to make sure I can get up, I can make it work for me. I can have a poem come out of this class. Um, and so this poem came out of that class uh, on Victorian literature where I discovered that Victorian women were forbidden from practicing botany because the men thought that the cross-section of the plants and flowers too closely resembled 
female genitalia. And so I thought, okay, yeah, I could definitely make this work for me. So this poem is called Portrait of Eve as the Anaconda. I too am gathering the vulgarity of botany, the eye and its nuclei for mischief. Of man redacted I came, I'm coming, fasting, starving, carved myself, a selfish idol, its shell unsuitable. I, twice discarded, arrived thornside, and soon outgrew his reptilian sheen, a fine specimen. Let me have it. Something in violet, splayed in bird lime, legs and exposed anemone against jailbait August, its x-ray sky. This light, a gorgon slick, polygamous doom, and God again calling much too late, who aches to stick an ache in my unmentionable. His primal plant remains elusive, wildfire and pathogen, blood not of human flesh there in his beard. How I am hot for it. Call me murderous, a glowing engine timed to blow. Watch it go with unjealousy shadow. Let me have it. This maidenhead primeval schemes what ovule of cruel invention, the Venus trap, the menses, and how many ways to announce this guilt. Whore's nest of ague, supernova, wild stigmata, womb. I boast a vogue sacrosanctum, engorging shored pornographies, the cells unruly strain, rogue empire multiplying for a thousand virile thousand years, my wings pinned wide in parthenogenesis, such miraculous display. I think I'll read my last poem. And it's a new poem. <laughs> it hasn't been published. Um, and it's, a, it's an ekphrastic poem that's based on a Glenn Ligon piece of the same name called Double America. And it is also a palindrome writ large, so the poem reads the same way forward and the same way backward. And it begins with an epigraph by Aimé Césaire. The hour of the barbarian is at hand, the modern barbarian, the American hour. Aimé Césaire, Discourse on Colonialism. Every black life goes the way of the bison eventually. Forgotten, bone threaded to earth, a gash of weeds goring yellow through my brother's skull. In the desert, buck full with your good lead, the last bald eagle rakes his clipped invisible wings down the parched highway where a river used to be. My father, fretful, dying because he was hungry. You and you daily, weekly pass his living body cold in the street. Here, invisible, is a way of being. My mother, quiet, sweeping inside your mansions. My mother, sullen, dreaming of a nation that might someday dream me. America, I am poor and always fixed and unfixable. My poverty, a bullet point and a bullet hole. Endangered, my body soars its dark unseemly flare across these decades, shot through with blues, chained face to face. My sister and I pleading, look at me. Aren't I a woman, America? Aren't I a woman? America, chained face to face, my sister and I pleading, look at me. 
unseemly flare across these decades shot through with blues and a bullet hole, endangered my body sores, its dark ways fixed and unfixable, my poverty a bullet point that might someday dream me. America, I am poor in all your mansions. My mother, sullen, dreaming of a nation is a way of being. My mother, quiet, sweeping inside. Pass his living body cold in the street, here invisible because he was hungry. You and you, Daily, weekly, where a river used to be. My father, fretful, dying. His clipped, invisible wings down the parched highway, buck full with your good lead. The last bald eagle rakes, goring yellow through my brother's skull in the desert. Forgotten, bone threaded to earth, a gash of weeds. Every black life goes the way of the bison, eventually. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sophia, for your words, your language, and your love. Such joy, such rarity to witness the poet's own words transform the poet in real time. Baldwin says to love something is to make it conscious of the things it does not know. Thank you, Sophia, for, if nothing else, making us conscious. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight um, in beauty and joy and the love of consciousness, I suppose, and the expansion and to become more human. Um, I want to let you all go because the night is ending and the moon is out. And so uh, if we can all for one more time, please thank you so much, Sophia. And thank you to the Longhorns for giving us an opportunity and a platform to celebrate poetry. And I'm going to talk to you all like I talk to my students um, in this way. Um, uh, as always, my loves, uh, be kind to yourselves and each other. I love you all. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>